Hi, I'm Matt Jordan. Welcome to Digium Live. I'm CTO of Digium. With me today, I've got Matt Fredrickson, project lead of the Asterisk Project. How's it going, Matt? It's going really well, really well. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Great, cool. So we're going to talk today about all things Asterisk 15, which was released, what, at Astrocon this year? That's right. It was the beginning of October. Wow, and it's already been a month. Yep. Crazy to think about. A month since the we got to experience the sweltering humidity of Florida. That's right. Well, it wasn't that sweltering. I'm just embellishing. Yeah. So what was the focus of Asterisk 15 this year? So uh, that's a very great question. Asterisk 15, actually, um, when we were trying to decide what we should, what parts of Asterisk needed the most work after the many, many years it's been around as a project, we came to the conclusion that Asterisk needed an under the hood overhaul with regards to its media engine and particularly with regards to video. So traditionally with Asterisk, there's been a limitation that a call consists of some audio and at, ma and at max one video stream and sometimes some text involved there. And that's been a core assumption in Astros for a very long time. Did we really actually have even a concept of streams or was it sort of just we were just passing audio and video and text frames through? Great question. So I guess if you want to get down in the weeds. Yeah, let's go into the weeds. Okay. okay. We've got developers here. <laughs> Um, yeah, there, I mean, there wasn't really a good concept of a stream in Asterisk. There were some implicit assumptions about media and things like that that you could conceptually think of as streams, but they weren't really, there weren't explicit streams in Asterisk until this last year. And that was one of the things that we um, solidified as a concept within Asterisk. So would you say one of the goals was to get to video, but before you could even get there, you first had to even tackle that fundamental notion of media streams? I think that's exactly right. Excellent. Very cool. So what video things have you done in Asterisk 15? So, you know, this is a really, uh, really good question. Um, we wanted to, to make Asterisk to be able to act in the same way that you see many other projects are starting to do with like really new media experiences and provide a new media experience for the users of Asterisk. Like, um, for example, people have started to become accustomed to video being a default mode of communication, particularly with browsers and things like that, being able to see lots of people at the same time and be able to talk to lots of people at the same time. And so in order for Asterisk to be able to work well in that market, we had to be able to make Asterisk do that. So, so we added support to ConfBridge, Asterisk conferencing application, to be able to provide this multi-video, multi-user experience. That's really cool. Yeah. So what kind of, I know there's different approaches to video in different projects. Mm -hmm. What approach did Asterisk take? So um, there are a few different ways to, uh, to provide a video experience. And, and one of them is called a video MCU. And what a video MCU does is it takes everybody's, all the participants' streams, and it stitches them all together into a square up on the server. And then you have like a, maybe a Brady Bunch type layout, you know, <laughs> for, for a story. visualization. That's right. <laughs> and, and then you send that same experience back to every one of the users. And, and that's a, actually a really um, popular experience. A lot of people use it for a very long time. But the last few years, um, the uh, endpoints in particular have gotten a lot more powerful. Well, we have a browser now, right? That's right. And th those things update every night. That's right. <laughs> and so when you have an endpoint that can decode multiple streams at the same time, you can start sending everybody's streams to everybody else. And so instead of having a fixed experience for everybody, everybody can have their own individual view into the conference and have their own configuration of participants and things like that. And what is that traditionally called? And that's called a, a, it's an SFU, a selective forwarding unit. Excellent, cool. So under the hood, inside Astros 15, ConfBridge, our conferencing application, now has the ability to act as an SFU. That's right. Really cool. So what else have you guys been up to in Astros 15? Because that sounds like a lot of work. It was a ton of work. And you know, just saying those, those words, <laughs> it, it encompasses like many, many man months of work just to make those simple, you know, Simple features work, simple. right? It sounds simple, but there were tons and tons of things that had to happen. But some of the other things that went with that, um, we had to uh, add support for some new technologies that, that some of the browsers started to adopt. One was called Bundle. Mm. And this is a really low-level topic, but it was a really fancy way of making um, browsers be able to talk to each other a lot quicker, to connect media streams together a lot quicker. It was to shorten call setup times and things like that and be able to use less ports. Ah, so, you know, in a traditional sort of call setup by SIP, you would need a different RTP port for each media stream, correct? That's right. And so with the browsers, they're trying to smash them all together and interleave them over a single port. That's right. That's exactly right. Kind of like X2. <laughs> oh, wait a, that's a low blow, I think, at this yeah. point. <laughs> 
What's yeah. old is new again. That's right. All that's right. right, so what are you most personally proud of in the project that's happened over the past year? You know, I, I am, to be honest, I'm super proud that we were able to hit our goal of an SFU, of SFU support in time for Astrocon. We, um, when we first looked at that project, we estimated about a year and a half's worth of work, and we started it early last year, and we knew if we continued with that project schedule, we probably would not have made it. Um, and so we took a step back and looked at some of the things that we we decided to do, and we figured out what things were really essential, and we figured out a way to be able to make a MVP or minimum viable product SFU by Astrocon. So it's probably worth noting then too that you know what is getting released in Asterisk 15 represents probably just a first step of, cap of video capabilities in Asterisk. I think that's exactly right. That's right. So we started off and we got most of the core changes done in Asterisk to be able to. Um, handle all these different video streams and, and even multiple audio streams and other things. Um, but in terms of fleshing out the different modules and things in Asterisk, there are a lot, there's a lot of other work that can be done to improve. So if you're an open source contributor, there's plenty of things for you to come help out on. That's what I'm hearing, right? And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> and yep. you know, that's, that's one of the great things about Asterisk being an open source project is that even if you're not willing and, and raring to jump into the video work, there's lots of other things that you could come do that helps free up people on the core team here at Digium to go focus on video. That's right, that's exactly right. So we had some great contributors this year too, didn't we? We did, yeah. We've had, um, uh, there's been a number of different prominent contributors. We've got a few regular outside of Digium contributors that um, I definitely want to uh, give props to. <laughs> uh, Seems a okay fitting to time. Yeah, uh, you know, there's uh, there's uh, uh, a man named Sean Bright, and he actually he came to Astrocon this year to help um, with Astrocon and be able to participate. And he's a very prominent developer on the Asterisk project. Um, there's another individual, Corey Farrell, who very regularly contributes. And and I would classify. I talked a little bit about this at Astrocon, but I would classify there are, are different kinds of contributors to the project, and different motivations for contribution. Mm -hmm. And some people contribute, um, and there's nothing wrong with the different motivations. It's just people work at different levels and have different interests, right? Um, and some people contribute to the point where they kind of solve their own problem. Like they're working on something and they get stuck somewhere, and they decide to use their development expertise to solve the particular problem that they're stuck on, right? And then they decide that they want to contribute it back, and they send it back up to us, and we say, oh, okay. And we go through the submission process and try to get it merged. Um, there are other uh, developers who get very uh, involved and Put more, uh, get more uh, self-interest, I guess, in the project itself right. for long term, and they start to not just work on their own problems, but they decide to start helping others with their problems. And um, we appreciate both kinds of contributors, but um, you know, I definitely want to uh, put special note to those that do assist others with their problems and things like that. And Sean Bright, Corey Farrell, uh, there's an individual named Alexander Trout who regularly contributes. Um, Alexei Gardini. Um, Walter Dokies, and there's a number of others that have contributed this last year. And, and I, I, I feel bad because there are tons that I'm not saying right now. <laughs> and we don't have a list in front of us right now. That's it's right. not on my notes, as it turns out. Exactly. It's off, and, and to be so honest. Off the, off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, there were actually, I think, about 90 different contributors That's to fantastic. the Asterisk 15 so, since we... Um, since we started develop on, development on Asterisk 15, we've had 90 different contributors contribute code. That's great. So let's talk maybe a little bit about some of the users of Asterisk. If I'm a system integrator or if I'm a, a system administrator of Asterisk, what's in Asterisk 15 for somebody like me? Uh, okay, so um, Asterisk 15, if you're a system administrator, you already have de deployed Asterisk that you're maintaining mm -hmm. and utilizing. That, that's, that's what I kind of think of when I think about a system administrator. So um, you already have Asterisk you're using as a PBX maybe of some sort yep. in your network. Um, Asterisk 15 allows you to very easily add, again, video support to that, to that network. So let's say you've got uh, you know, handsets, phones, and things like that hooked up to it. Use it for conference. Maybe even a security camera? That's right. You Ooh. could um, have SIP-enabled security cameras to watching uh, you know, your front door or whatever, um, your main office, your lobby. Um, you can interconnect with those, and people can see those uh, devices and see what's going on in ways that were not previously possible. Very cool. Um, what was the next, uh, sorry, you have to remind <laughs> no, me about the next. Business application developers. Let's say I'm somebody who's building a larger system on top of Asterisk. I've got it integrated in, maybe under the hood. And I want to make use of some of the capabilities in Asterisk for my next major large project. 
Okay, great. That, that's so. Next category is business app. Okay, so business application. <laughs> yeah, I'm repeating you. Right. Um, so business application developers. I, I kind of think of that person as somebody who's actually taking asterisk and not using it necessarily as a PBX, but as somebody who's using it as a telephony development platform. Maybe right? a PBX. Maybe something totally different. Yes. And so, um, in order to um, utilize the video support and asterisk, we of course added a API extensions so that people can. You know that our API developers or work at a level where you're programmatically controlling asterisk can take advantage of that as well. So let's say I'm using the asterisk REST interface. How would I go create a bridge that could take advantage of the selective forwarding unit capabilities? Very good question. So um, the the new uh, there was an extension added or an option added to the uh, the bridge creation function. Excellent. So that I guess you know this is really going really low level. But there was an option added to the bridge creation function to be able to have this new kind of bridge. It's a new kind of bridge in Asterisk land, which involves video. So when I create it, I just say, please give me a selective forwarding unit bridge instead of, say, just a regular mixing bridge. And it gives me one with those capabilities. Exactly. Oh, and that's great. It, and it knows kind of how to handle that new situation and takes right. care of all the nitty gritty details for you. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Cool. All right, so what's next in Asterisk? What's coming up? Oh man, this is like the million dollar question, right? It's like, where, <laughs> take out your crystal ball, figure out what's going on. But you mean you just don't tell all the open source developers what to do and they all just do it magically for you? Well, you know, that's, you, you, know, you say this and you know exactly how it goes because you've been there. But in, in one sense, what the, the future of Asterisk, you know, to some extent we can plan for it and we can do things, but the other side of it too is um, the future of Asterisk involves people that I have not met yet. Um, there are people that are going to make contributions and changes to Asterisk and take it in directions that I never, ever imagined it could go. So there's one side of it. And that's sort of like the catch-all answer, right? Mm -hmm. But from a, from a planning perspective... Yeah, for the Digium core team here. Yeah. Um, we, I, I think that the, at least the next year, some of the things that we're looking at are continuing to improve the video experience. Um, we want to build out our test infrastructure to better test video. That's, that's a big thing because... There's a lot of ground to cover in there. That's right. That's exactly right. Because there's a lot of new things that... We, we do have some test coverage, but we want to make sure that the, the quality of the Asterisk project continues to go up as time goes on. And I think generally that's been the case. And part of that for us, for the new video support, is improving the test coverage. And, and lastly, probably to include better video resiliency functionality. So video working better in um, poor network environments mm -hmm. with Wi-Fi and things like that, being able to add support for, for things that allow error correction with video right. and things like that. Things that we didn't realize were important. Very important we when you're uh, passing a whole lot of data over that uh, UDP packets as opposed to just a few little bit of audio here and there. Exactly. Yep. You, you never would have known with just an audio stream because it, it generally sends, it tends to self-correct very quickly. Right. But video, there's a lot bigger loss associated with it. And you see pictures freezing and things like that. So <laughs> it's really important to do those yeah. things, to, 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 or to do it right, rather. Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks, Mr. Matt Fredrickson. Appreciate your time today. Uh, just for everybody out there, we've got a webinar coming up, Asterisk 15 Under the Hood, with the lovely Mr. Matt Fredrickson, Asterisk Project Lead. That'll be on Tuesday, December 5th. And you can find out all sorts of things about Asterisk and all more of that technical nitty-gritty detail that Matt alluded to today on video, selective forwarding units, multiple media streams, and all things cool going on in the Asterisk Project. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.